I'm here with Anne Rowe, um, who's the, this year's Shelley Lecturer for the British Humanist Association, the inaugural uh, Shelley Lecturer. Hello, Anne. Hello. Nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, you have written a biography uh, of Shelley. That's uh, one of the things you're going to be talking about uh, this evening. What really appealed to you about Shelley as a life? What made you really want to get engaged with that story? It was the poetry that led me into Shelley. It was just one day I was sitting in a garden in Sussex and I happened to read part of Ode to the West Wind and immediately I was almost swept off my feet by it and I decided I've got to find out what the life of such a man is like. The life of a poet of that amount of greatness is not going to be like the life of a banker or a politician. This is going to be a life that is formed by the poetry and where the poetry is the real life, that's the landscape he's living in, that's the world he's moving in not our world and so that led me to try and write a book which would be set in that world and dealing with the poetry as a real landscape and a real obsession a real quest and and so i tackled mm. his life that way in fact there's not very much in it of his biographical life because i feel so many people notably richard holmes mm. have done it really well there's no need for another one what there is a need for is to inhabit Shelley's mind for a while in the way we can through the poetry, I hope. And we're here to, uh, today really, I suppose, part of the point of the lecture being right now is that it's the 200th anniversary of his being sent down from this place, from the University of Oxford. Exactly. March the 25th, 1811. Oh, was it? That's the exact date. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> and um, he was sent down for something that he published and circulated. That's right, isn't it? That was right. It was a little pamphlet. It's only 14 pages called The Necessity of Atheism, which simply asks for proofs of God's existence. It doesn't say definitively there is no God. It just says we can't prove there is one and the human mind must have sufficient proper evidences of truth. That's all Shelley asks for, but it's too much. And um, he tries to get it noticed by scattering it round the Oxford bookshops. It's immediately spotted and burned. He's sent down together with a friend who helped him to write it. And that really is the, I think, the formative experience of his life. Because after that, he's tarred as a rebel, he's offended the establishment, he's outraged his father, he can't really go home again. He becomes an outcast from that moment, eventually an exile, it's an exile that he dies. Yes. And so the whole shape of the life, I think, stems from the publication of that pamphlet. Why did he feel so strongly about that particular issue at that particular time? There are many reasons for it, and some of them are quite personal reasons, because he'd been questioning God's existence, and because he had, he was already beginning to jeopardize his social standing. He'd already ruined a, pen, a pending engagement he had to his cousin, Harriet. So he'd ruined his love life because he insisted on disbelieving. And he hated God because he felt God was restricting his life, God was obstructing his search for truth, and all this superstition was simply feeding into the tyrannical mm. actions of the government. And so for every good reason, he believed he'd got to put God aside. Mm. And he got to tell other people to do the same and liberate the human race. And this was becoming more and more a driving passion with him. So that was why he wrote it, although he knew the risks very well. Yes. Yes, I mean, it seems strange now for those sorts of risks to attach, you know, just a couple of centuries ago to yes. just a, a simple statement of doubt. Just a couple. I mean, even going so far as saying that you believe in a supreme being, but not in scripture, God yeah. you put in jail. Yeah. Even that. The trouble is, you know, it sounds like Jacobinism, it sounds like the French Revolution. Mm. So the government just isn't going to countenance even a whisper of it. Sure. Shelley obviously went on to be something of a defender and a promoter of liberty and universal brotherhood Absolutely. and so on. Yeah. Do you think that those two ideas were connected in his, in his mind, this idea of you know, doubt and uh, the freedom to doubt and, and also universal brotherhood? Is there a connection? Or? Um, I suppose so. I mean, the freedom to question and doubt comes first. And then it's the feeling that the power men have is their own power the feeling that you don't wait for God's power to work in the world. Mm. The power you've got is yours. Mm. You make it. That power's based on love, and it's based on selfless love, which must embrace everybody. And so, yes, there is a connection, but that love can't be liberated yeah. until the old systems are swept aside. 
So you start by questioning, you start by finding truth, and the truth within yourself, which is the love within yourself. That's quite a dynamic call, really, to It's a to fantastic action. call. It's a call for mankind to release its potential. And Shelley went on and on believing it and being frustrated that no one would understand it, that every revolution was based on revenge and not on love. So he hoped he could inspire a new revolution based on love, which would eventually sweep the world. A lot of his poetry is about it coming to pass, but of course it hasn't come to pass. Yet. 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 <laughs> Yet. <laughs> it's wonderful that we're able to remember his life, hopefully every year from now on with the, with the Shelley Lecture, and we're really looking forward to the lecture you're going to give us this evening. Thanks Great. So I'm looking forward to it too. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers.